Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, May 26th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we start by recapping an Orioles loss. They come up just short of taking the series from the Yankees and fall 2-0 in the Bronx in the final of a three-game set on Wednesday night. I'll get you the five things you need to know from an Orioles loss in which the offense just went silent against New York. Then, we'll finally take a closer look at the AA Bowie Bay Sox this year. I've gone through every other full-season minor league team in the system. Today, we learn about the Bay Sox. And Matt Sabados, the new play-by-play -play voice of the Bowie Bay Sox, joins the pod to talk about some hitters who have stood out in the lineup, like guys like Jordan Westberg, some pitchers who have thrown the ball well, like Drew Rahm, and we'll get into some lesser-known guys and talk a little bit about Matt's broadcasting career so far and what brought him to Bowie. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So we start today with an Orioles loss. They fall 2-0 to the New York Yankees on Wednesday night. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by rockauto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them Locked On sent you. And before we get started, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. Of course, first and foremost, we are here on all your audio platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen, Monday through Friday, new episodes five days a week. If you could leave a rating and a review on any of those apps, it helps a lot. But we're also right here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube page. Thanks to everyone who has subscribed so far. As of Wednesday, we are up above 400 subscribers on the YouTube page. Next up, let's try to get to 500. So, you know, come over and just click that red subscribe button. It really helps out a lot. But again, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first listen of the day. And for your first listen today, we start with Orioles and Yankees. Game three of a three-game set. Orioles fall 2-0 in New York and drop two out of three in the series against the Bronx Bombers. A series that started so well for the Orioles with the big win on Monday night came up just short. The devastating walk-off loss in the 11th on Tuesday. And then the offense just didn't get it going in a 2-0 loss on Wednesday. Orioles leave New York with an 18-27 and record on the season. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from this Orioles loss. And the first thing you need to know is that, well, this may have been, maybe, the Orioles' worst offensive game of the year. They were shut out for just the third time all season. The only two other shutouts were back on May 14th. They lost 3-0 on the road in Detroit. And then all the way back to the opening series of the season, they lost a game 8-0 in the third game of the year in Tampa Bay back on April 10th. So it's been a while now. They did get five hits. The season low is four. They've done that a few times, so at least they got five hits. But only four hard hit balls on the night, one of their lowest total. I believe that is their lowest total of the year. Only four balls hit off the bat, 95 miles per hour or more. and. Just really, they couldn't get anything going. And again, they've been shut out a couple times. They've scored one run a couple times. They've had some bad showings early in the year. I mean, they went 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position on Wednesday night. They've done worse than that, especially early in April. But I think the reason why I'm going to call this one the worst offensive performance of the year is because who it came against for the Yankees. This was not Garrett Cole. This was not Jordan Montgomery or Luis Severino. This was J.P. Sears, a lefty making his first major league start who threw five scoreless. This was Ron Marinaccio, the kind of basically 4A reliever who threw two perfect innings. This was Lucas Letke, who the Orioles walked off on last Thursday, who got a couple of outs. Now, they did finish with Miguel Castro, and then Clay Holmes got the save, who's been unhittable. But against Sears and Marinaccio for seven innings, you got to score on those guys. And the Orioles just did not do that on Wednesday night. But the second thing that you need to know is that despite the bad performance across the board, by far easily the best hitter in the lineup from what he did Wednesday night 
was Adley Rutschman. Batted six for the Orioles and caught this one and had his first career multi-hit game. Two for four with a couple of singles on the day. Did not strike out, did not walk either, but he came up with a really, really impressive at-bat in the second inning. A 10-pitch AB that ended with a single from the right side against Yankee starter J.P. Sears. And then flash forward to the ninth inning, facing probably the best reliever in baseball so far this year in Clay Holmes. And Adley goes after a first pitch sinkler and just grounds it up the middle for a base hit. That one in the ninth inning, 102 miles per hour off the bat, the hardest hit ball of Rutschman's major league career to date. So definitely a good day for Adley, who saw 19 pitches in his four at-bats. And he is averaging just shy of six pitches per plate appearance on the year. If you extrapolate that, obviously Adley has you know only been up since Saturday, but there is no major leaguer this year averaging as many pitches per plate appearance as Adley Rutschman. Again, he's just shy of six at the moment. His plate discipline, which we've known about throughout the minors, has translated immediately to the major leagues. And while you know he's hitting 250 so far, he had a two-hit game, he's only got the one extra base hit, hasn't homered yet. He's catching well defensively, he's framing well, and he's taking pitches, seeing the strike zone very, very well. That's been really impressive, and he had a really impressive night on a night when really no one else in the Oriole lineup impressed. Adley was kind of the one guy who did it on Wednesday. Third thing you need to know from this one is that it was another just ho-hum, solid start. Keep racking him up for Tyler Wells, who again, you know, we know is not going to go more than five innings many times this year, but He pitched those five innings once again on Wednesday night. Five innings, two runs allowed on five hits. He struck out two. He did not walk anyone, no long balls. 77 pitches on the night for Wells, who allowed seven hard hit balls in the game and now has a 4.30 ERA on the season. And, you know, the only two runs they came in the fourth inning from the Yankees, they ended up being the only two runs of the game. Wells had allowed just one hit through three innings, but came out in the fourth, gave up a couple of singles, hung a 2-2 breaking ball to Miguel Andujar, who lined one into left field for an RBI single to make it 1-0, and then Andujar took off for second, and Adley made not a terrible throw, but not a good throw down to second base. It went into center field, allowed that second run to score. Because of what transpired later in the inning with the ball getting put in play, it still ended up being an earned run to Tyler Wells, but that was it. He came back out through a, a nice fifth inning, and yeah, the strikeout stuff was not there for Wells uh, like it has been at times this year, just the two strikeouts, but he continues to do this thing, which he's done a couple of times this year, which is get a good amount of whiffs without getting strikeouts. He had 11 whiffs on 77 pitches, 11 whiffs on 47 swings, not a bad number at all. But to just get the two strikeouts, he's not getting his two strike whiffs. He's getting whiffs early in the count, just not throwing those good put-away pitches to get the strikeouts. But it was an interesting day for Wells, who for the first time this season threw more sliders than fastballs. It was 28 sliders, 25 fastballs, 22 changeups, and then he tossed in two curveballs to make his 77 pitches. Really interesting, essentially a three-pitch almost even split between the slider, fastball, and changeup. Fastball was good, got three whiffs. Slider was great, got six whiffs on the day on 23 swings. They put that ball in play a lot. His fastball velo was a little bit up today, averaging 94, touched 96. Again, I liked what I saw, and the best part of Tyler Wells, once again, no walks in this game. That is now six of his last seven starts. Tyler Wells has not walked a batter. Again, he has not walked a batter in six of his last seven starts. Really impressive from the Orioles' new starting pitcher. And the fourth thing you need to know continues with the pitching is that the bullpen just came in and did its job and kept this at a 2-0 game. The offense just never helped them out. I mean, the Oriole bullpen throws three scoreless innings. You have Joey Crable, a 1-2-3-6 with a strikeout. Logan Gillespie with a nice bounce back one, or not a 1-2-3, but a scoreless seventh after he surrendered the lead in the seventh on Tuesday night. And then how about Marcos Deplan? He was the most impressive reliever for the Orioles tonight. Remember, the Orioles recalled Deplan on Monday when they needed the extra pitching. Didn't use him in the first two games, but he made just his second appearance of the year in the big leagues, first since April 18th. And that was the most electric I have ever seen Marcos Deplan stuff look. He threw 16 pitches, got a 1-2-3 inning with two strikeouts against the top of the Yankee order. 
It was six curveballs, five changeups, and five fastballs, which was interesting. Fastball was 94 to 95. That was a little harder than we saw him throw last year. The curveball is shaped differently. He's throwing it much harder as well. Got two whiffs on that pitch. Impressive inning from Marcos Duplan. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 2-0 loss to the Yankees on Wednesday night is that I know the Orioles lost two of three in this series, and it was especially heartbreaking the way they lost Tuesday, and it was frustrating the way they lost Wednesday. It felt like a game they should have won. But I see this series, my final takeaway from this game and from the series, this series was a net positive for the Baltimore Orioles. Yes, they lost two of three, but they came out there on Monday night and got the big hits late in the game and came away with the victory on Monday. And then they got the big hits late on Tuesday, took that late lead, gave it up, took the lead again in extras, and they lost that game because they had a tired bullpen. If they would have had Felix Bautista and Jorge Lopez available on Tuesday night, I firmly believe the Orioles would have won that game too. Now, the bullpen being available didn't really factor into Wednesday night. Offense just had a night off, basically. But I take away a lot of positives from this series. I think the Orioles should feel really, really good taking a series from the Rays, playing really well against the Yankees, heading into this five-game set against the Red Sox after the off day coming up this weekend. But the Orioles fall 2 nothing on the road and drop two out of three in the series with the Yankees. But of course, as we continue to cover this major league team playing better than we thought it would, we also continue to cover the minor league teams. And today, we're finally going to take a full look at the AA Bowie Bay Sox as Matt Sabados is going to join us here on the podcast. He is the new play-by-play voice of the Orioles AA affiliate. And he's going to join us to talk about guys like Drew Rahm and Jordan Westberg and others on this Bay Sox team. We'll talk a little bit about Matt's career and what got him to Bowie as well. But first, let's talk about rockauto.com, which is the best place to go for all your auto parts needs. Because with all the makes and models of every car out there, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing only the brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You save time and you save money when using Rock Auto. So why choose to spend 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store? Just go to rockauto.com. They're a family business for over 20 years and the prices are reliably low for every customer, even a customer like me who knows nothing about cars but needs some parts from time to time. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. And write Locked On Orioles in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com So the Orioles are certainly playing a little better baseball at the major league level, but a lot of talent coming up as well at the minor league level. And we did a lot of our minor league previews a couple of weeks ago, but now we get to finish that off with the double A Bowie Bay Sox. A whole lot of talent at that double A level. And we've got the new voice of the Bowie Bay Sox, or maybe not new to people who have been listening all season, but at least new to the podcast in Matt Sabados, who joins us here on the pod. Matt, first of all, thank you so much uh, for taking some time to jump on the pod. Yeah, absolutely, Connor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and so we we have you on to talk Bowie Bay Sox, which, you know, in terms of wins and losses, it hasn't been, at least so far, the season that Bowie put together last year and in 2019. But in terms of talent, obviously, there is a lot of it on this roster. Now, my early disclaimer here is we're not really going to touch on Gunnar Henderson because we had John Mioli on the podcast last week. If anyone wants to hear a lot about Gunnar and his success this year, go listen to last week's episode with John Mioli of Maximizing Playoff Odds. But Matt, let's start with another one of the top infield prospects, and that is Jordan Westberg, who I know had a kind of a slow mm-hmm. start to the season. He started to pick things up a little bit. What have you seen from him? Why the slow start? And and how has he looked when he's been hitting better at times this season? So, yeah, there, there was about a two-week stretch where he was hitting about 100 for a spell, and it, it that, that that's just tough to handle no matter who you are. You're watching it or in the middle of it, so... It was something that personally, I, I'm not even really sure what I could have pinpointed on it. I think it was just some of the the pitchers in in this league, and there's a lot of great pitching talent in the, in this Double A Eastern League. Uh, it, lately, though, there's not been. 
I, I'm not, I'm not specifically too positive, and I, I've tried, I've tried to to find the answer when it comes to speaking with Jordan or speaking with uh, with the coaching staff. Is like, is there anything that's been changing with him? Is there any different approach that you guys have been taking w- with him in the cage or or with him at the plate when it comes time uh, for the game? And no one's really been able to to piece together uh, a sizable answer. It's just been he he's he's a very results driven kind of guy and he's very he's he's not too he's not too methodical in his approach but he's got kind of the just the same attack that he's always been going at he hasn't really changed much of anything it's just it's just starting to click for him again and uh the, the best thing i can say is maybe it was just the that those start of season you know ramp ups and just dealing with the cold weather early on now that it's now that it's started to warm up a little bit he's been feeling better he's been swinging better and really been making a lot more barrels i think that's uh i think that's one of the more important things one of the only things that i think really uh kind of kick-started him there was a brief stint about two weeks ago at this point when Bowie was in redding uh facing off against the phillies affiliate westberg was shifted down in the lineup a couple of slots for the first time all season he was batting fifth and for three games he was hitting fifth and that was the turning point he just got those couple of extra at bats in the dugout to, to watch the pitcher work and those couple of extra at bats to speak with uh, his teammates after their late appearances to get an understanding of what the actual game time scenario is because it that can differ from the pregame sport. And since then, he's been back in his rhythm. So I'm not sure if that was the exact, was kind of the, the point that I followed along, along that he really turned it around. And now that he's back, I'm just really happy to see it because the the more the more that all these guys are firing the better Bowie is going to do and unfortunately it, it just means that they'll be up at AAA at some point in their careers if they keep playing at a, at such a high level with us but that's just the way minor league baseball is so i'm just really glad that that jordan is, has picked it back up and is doing what uh what what he's expected to do at this level and hopefully uh continues to do so yeah and you know he's he was an advanced hitter as soon as he was drafted in 2020 he was an advanced hitter at Mississippi State, and he's a guy who you know is able to, to to figure out you know kind of what is going into his slumps and and how to get out of them. So it's good to see him, as you said, picking it up a bit. And uh, I'm sure if he continues to pick it up, he's got a good chance to to as you said be at AAA this year. Another guy who you know I know because of some injury issues and different things, which Bowie I know has been riddled with at times this year, but yeah. Adam Hall has definitely stepped up so far this year. And another thing about yes. Adam Hall is. He's played a lot of outfield, and he's going to have to play more outfield because Cesar Prieto is in double-A. There's just too many good infielders. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on kind of, first of all, Hall in the outfield defensively, and then what his bat has looked like because the bat has kind of dragged behind over the last couple of years. Yeah, there's there's not really anything that's stood out to me in terms of his outfield work. Obviously, the, um, the two weeks off, hurt and did a lot of our our potential look at at what he's capable of because he has only played in team games so far this season because of the injuries uh, so uh, I've, I've i've not seen anything that's blown me away but i've also not seen anything that's made me say well he can't be a serviceable outfielder he's he's you know answered the call that that's been given to him and and done his job the, in terms of the work at the plate, I I really putting together a, a relatively good season. He's hitting 361 here at home. And that leadoff spot, that, that's just perfect for him. He batted sixth on opening day. And since then, he's been leading off in the games that he's been active for. And he 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 really hits the ball well. If he's the first batter in an inning, he's got a 948 OPS. Like that's a that's a pretty good number to roll with from from a leadoff guy because that means he's he's getting on base and sometimes hitting for a little bit of power while the power numbers are reasonable for Hall. It's it's more so on just the the walks and the actual base hits, the just the relative singles for him. So he, he's he's definitely a deal with it when it comes to, to missing the the two weeks. That's just, that's a significant time loss that you've got to build yourself and and ramp back up into the full day to day routine of playing ball. But he he's another one of those guys that just goes out and does his job. He, he he doesn't overthink the stuff. He just you know continues to work and, and work to the best of his ability. So if if this trend continues for him, especially in the lease lot, I, I can't imagine that it, it'd be a difficult decision. Maybe get that 
next opportunity at the next level to see what he could maybe produce against against triple a pitching when that is no clue could couldn't even venture a guess but he's i've i've really been impressed with you know the the types of work that, that he's been put in the the situations he's been put in and that in the work he's produced in those unique situations and as we stay with hitters you know there's there's a lot of other top prospects i could ask you about but instead yeah. i want to ask you about the guy who is certainly not a top prospect but has maybe been Bowie's best hitter over the past couple of weeks and that's shane fontana who is making his name known in this Bay Sox lineup, you know, what has that breakout been like, looked like for him? And, and, you know, how are, you know, if you've gotten a chance to chat with them, like how are the coaches talking about Fontana? Cause he went from outfield depth to he's kind of in the middle of this order now. Yeah. So he, he, he started the season, I think it was over 12 and he was turning days, days in and days off uh, on the bench. And, uh, there was, I think it was since mid-April, he'd, he'd been batting around 330, 340, something along those lines. And uh, it, it's, he, he, he's he's not the kind of guy that can really pinpoint it himself either. Or, or, and if he can, it's it's not something that, that can be well articulated. So, so it, I've now to get a concise answer out of, out of Fontana. And fortunately, it's just fun to talk about it. I think one of the things that he's really picked up is the the trademark plate discipline that that buoy and the Orioles system as a whole have have really been just hammering home is that he he's drawn out plate appearances a lot longer making sure he's waiting for the best possible pitch that he can see in that plate appearance and buoy is one of the best teams in in the league in that regard they they've played two fewer games than than most other teams in the league just because of some postponements and some rainouts and they've got they, in essence, they have seen more pitches than any other team in the league. That's just how long they they sit around in their plate appearances, watching balls outside of the zone because they're not going to chase at something that they know that they would only hit weekly, and they'll foul off pitches that'll be borderline. They they really have one of the best understandings of the zone in the entire league, and Fontana is just the latest in that group to really pick it up and run with it, and you get to to get the best possible pitch to hit for a single, a double, and lately a home run a couple of points so uh, i'm really glad to see him step up unfortunately though he did actually just go on the injured list recently and i'm not sure how long this stint is going to be uh hopefully it's not too too long but it, it might be a, at least a little bit it's going to be at least seven days before we see him just because of the uh the minimum there so hopefully uh he'll be back soon and uh back healthy yeah hopefully he can get back in that lineup because he's starting to look like you know, last year in Bowie, it was Pat Dorian, who was kind of a depth prospect that turned into, you know, one of their best hitters, looks like at least so far. It's Fontana doing that this year. We'll be back in just a second with Matt Sabados of the Bowie Bay Sox talking about some arms who have impressed and some big names in the Orioles AA affiliate. But first, got to tell you about LinkedIn Talent Solutions, because with spring in the air, it's a time of renewal and growth, personally and professionally. And as your small business grows, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can create a job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. They've got simple tools like screening questions that make it easier to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. So LinkedIn Jobs, it helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? So you can post your job for free if you go to linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So we're here with the voice of the Bowie Bay Sox, Matt Sabato, is talking about some hitters first. Now let's move over to some pitchers. And the guy I want to ask you about first is actually the guy who took the bump on Tuesday night, actually last night as we record this here on Wednesday morning. And that, of course, is Antonio Velez, who came over in the early season trade with the Marlins when the Orioles sent Cole Sulcer and Tanner Scott over to Miami. And Velez has had a really interesting year because 31 innings, 36 strikeouts, and eight walks. You're saying, that's pretty good. But an yeah. ERA close to eight, not so much. The question becomes, what is kind of the, the break off? What is not completely clicking where he's missing bats at times, but when they hit him, it seems like he's getting hit hard. So I... 
I'm not I'm not as positive as to how the the Marlins may have tried to develop him as a pitcher. And the the best I can say is that I I know him personally. He has described himself as a ground ball kind of guy, and uh, he's worked that uh that tenant well at a couple of points this season there was one start against uh akron the the guardians affiliate i think it was late april where he had thrown five innings on just 35 pitches and to to do that with that ground ball kind of stuff is so so helpful for a bullpen that that can get depleted at points especially with the injuries that Bowie has had to deal with but i'm not the, I know that the way that some organizations may develop pitchers these days is that they focus a lot on the high strikeouts. And obviously the high strikeout numbers, the high strikeout to walk ratio for Velez is, is very, very impressive, just as you said. So I'm, I, I feel like th- this is just my complete opinion based on the numbers and based on the fact that he, he is a trade is that maybe he's, may, he's trying to make that transition into organization as more of a strikeout arm and less of a contact straight up ground ball pitcher. And it's, it's leading to just a little, little bit of that mix where sometimes he gives up that hard contact when trying to miss the barrel here or there. And it, 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 it can be tough along with sometimes, but he's uh he's a very straightforward kind of guy when it comes to, you know, his, his, aggression on the on the mound he 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 really wants to succeed and you can tell it so uh, i I'm, I'm really pulling for him to to turn the corner soon because he he's 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 a likable guy that you want to to see succeed especially when, when he's a when he's a traded piece like that the the orioles have invested a an amount of capital in in bringing him into the organization for that for that exact purpose after making that trade so it I really want him to, to succeed a little bit better, and I, I really think it will happen soon because I, I know it can't be easy joining an organization that close to opening day because he was he was acquired by Baltimore on April 4th, uh, reported here to Bowie on April 6th, and then pitched his first game in the organization on April 10th. So he, he's really just not had a lot of time to acclimate himself and and really settle in and maybe maybe study a lot of the material outright so now that like now that the months are starting to turn over i really think that he should be able to settle back in soon and and you know make that good maybe ryan of good strikeout numbers to getting a ground ball when he needs to 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 get out of maybe a jam here or there because the the home runs have really been what's what's hurt him the most so if if he can kind of transition that into just missing the barrels a little more often, he'll be an incredible starter if he can just make that slight little turn to turn some of those home runs into more of the strikeouts. Yeah, and, it, and it's a good thing that he's not struggling with the walks, so that's not something he needs to to really exactly. address. It's more about just that that hard contact. But from one lefty to another, obviously we got to talk about currently the top pitching prospect that is on this Bowie roster, and that is Drew Rahm, who I know returns on Wednesday night to make the start. So you, you've you gotten to see five starts out of Drew now, who is just kind of shooting up prospect rankings at this point. You know, what what in your eyes, you know, getting to, to kind of see him up close for the first time makes him special? Because a lot of people have preconceived notions about Rom, people who've been watching him since he was 18 years old and saying, oh, soft tossing lefty, soft tossing lefty, not a big prospect. But for someone who comes in to see him this year, Kind of what have you taken away from Drew Rom's five starts? I mean, I, I a lot of times I forget how young he is, and it, it that's what throws me a lot of times is when I remind myself that this guy is is still, if I'm not mistaken, he's still only 21 years old, and that's uh that that's a uh, check that he's uh he was born in '99. I know my math. Yeah, so he's he's 22. He's he's 22. So still, he, he's only 22 years. So. Uh, it, it's it's difficult at ta- at times to remember that he is so young in this organization in, in a in a just roster that's already relatively young compared to the rest of the league. He's uh, I, I've really enjoyed his his mix, and he 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 almost laughs about just how many pitches he offers. I, I think uh, he's got something along a five pitch mix. I, I've got it pulled up here actually. Give me just a quick second. It, the the four seamer then a curve a slider a change and he also uses a split finger from time to time but for him because sometimes when he's working with runners on base 
set points or early on uh, against the tough guys, he'll bring out a sidearm deliver and, and offer up a couple of more pitches from that sidearm slot. So he's he's just interesting guy when it comes to his versatility on the mound. And you, you take into consideration his age and the fact that he's added on, I want to say about 25, around 30 pounds of muscle since the start of spring training. He's really, really putting in some of the the most effort for for a, a lot of pitchers in this organization i feel and i don't want to discredit anyone but he he's just he's he's put on so much to to really try and keep himself in the conversation because he, he, like like you'd said aside from dl hall getting injured last season that set him up to be the top left-handed pitching prospect watched in the entire organization last year and he, he knew that was something that was happening, so he wanted to make sure that he didn't fall out of the conversation this year. And packing all that muscle is is definitely a good start, and he's just got to see what he can translate that into, whether it be more movement on some of his pitches or a little more velocity, what have you. He's been really working hard and putting things together well. I'm really looking forward to, to what he might be putting together today as he, he gets ready to start against Erie because it's going to be his first start since... Uh, since May 4th, so about about three weeks at this point for him. So, again, it's like I said, a little slow probably to ramp back up, so maybe won't go too far just because you take three weeks off. It, it, it will be a little difficult to go out and maybe try and throw six innings, but uh, I'm still hoping for for a good start and a good return for, for Drew Rom today. Yeah, so we talked about a couple of starters. So last thing, Matt, I wanted to ask, just, you know, the Bowie bullpen was was kind of a mess at times last year, and it's been a little more stable this year. But there's a lot of different arms. There's been different guys going on the injured list, guys pitching in different spots. Give me one reliever who you've watched come out of the bullpen for the Bay Sox this year who has impressed you. I really liked uh, – I, I could probably name a couple of guys, to be honest with you. I know Cameron Bishop is still on the injured list right now, and he's probably set to come off sometime during this series, but he's been very, very impressive. Morgan McSweeney just finished up a, a scoreless streak of seven and two-thirds scoreless innings. Uh, that that was very, very nice. Normally, I would have said Logan Gillespie, but obviously he's now up with the uh, with the big league club. He was a very fun guy to just chat with whenever he was around the, the clubhouse. Very fun story for him playing in indie ball for so, so long. Uh, the – Kind of the the household name of just funky guys that w- will always be difficult to to work with, though, in, especially in the clubhouses. Nolan Hoffman, sir, he uh, he has really just been starting to piece it together well for Bowie. He's given up like one run here and there in a handful of his, of his appearances, and the fact of the matter is, is that just about any side armor you're going to run into the positioning and the, the placement on the zone can get more wild at times but he's he's definitely tightening it up a little bit especially when he pitches to left hand it's really starting to locate a lot better just on the inside edge while throwing them off entirely and making them think it's just going to be a routine pitch outside it somehow finds its way on the inner half of the plate for an easy called strike and he, he's been so so good at, at tightening up the zone over the past few appearances Right now, he's riding two consecutive scoreless innings. Uh, I believe he came in. No, he didn't come in last night. Adam Adam Stoffer was the only pitcher last night. But uh, he he'll he'll probably appear at some point in this series, and I I look forward to him pitching well again. He's got you know routine strikeout to walk numbers right now at fourteen to five. But uh, again, a lot of that comes down to just you know settling back in and, and tightening up with that sidearm delivery because it can be difficult to. Pick up at the plate just as much as it is difficult to to locate when you're you're coming in at such a hard hard angle. Like, yeah, I really like I really like Hoffman. Really, anyone that comes in with a uh, with a funky uh, out out there delivery like that, something that's just a little, little bit against the norm, is always fun to watch. Yeah, he uh, a minor league rule five draft selection. Uh, him and Cole. Uvila have come in from that minor league rule five draft and done some good things in this system. And, you know, it's an exciting system to be a number one system ranked in baseball, Matt, that that you got to enter uh, to kind of be a part of this yeah. year. So before we finish up, I just wanted to give you a quick chance to kind of, you know, let Orioles fans who may not know much about you as you, you come in to call these Bay Sox games, kind of what your your broadcast career has been, the little elevator uh, pitch for Matt coming into this yeah. uh, buoy role. So I'm from St. Louis, uh, grew up there and went to college there, a small Division II school that didn't really have that much going for, but it had a radio station and I was able to make the most of my time there. Since then, uh, I've spent most of my adult life uh, working on the East Coast. I have, 
I've had two stints working in North Carolina, two stints working in Pennsylvania. I was working in Florida this past winter. Uh, I was a uh, former lead for the high A affiliate of the Houston Astros. They're now the low A affiliate, the Fayetteville Woodpeckers in the Carolina League. I had a low-level role with the AAA affiliate of the Philadelphia Phillies, the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. And then last season, I was uh, up with the Tigers affiliate in this league, the Erie Seawolves. So got to spend a lot of time uh, watching watching other top prospects, uh, Spencer Torkelson and Riley Green, uh, just smack the ball out of there. It, that was a very fun season, and uh, uh, I'm I'm really glad uh, really glad to have gotten the opportunities that I have, and really enjoying uh, really enjoying just watching some great ball this season and what's been just an incredible farm system filled with with so much impressive talent. It's just really really enjoyable to not only watch but talk with a lot of these guys. This is one of the best just it, people in in a clubhouse that I, that I've worked with in my career. I, I really enjoy the crew here. Yeah, Matt, we're happy to have you in this Orioles system. Uh, it's not just the players, you know, it's the coaches and it's uh, it's the broadcasters as well, which take this system uh, to number one in baseball. But Matt, thank you so much for joining us, talking base Sox. And I'm sure, you know, we only went over about six or seven players today. I'm sure we'll have you <laughs> yeah. back on later in the year to get through a lot of these guys who are uh, tearing it up down in Bowie this year. Absolutely, Connor. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So that was Matt Sabados, the play-by-play -play voice of the Bowie Bay Sox, joining us here on the podcast. And this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team 